but we're going to, we, I'm just doing things a little different this morning. Sometimes, have you ever, have you ever, I guess for me sometimes I wish that, um, that I could share something before we worship. You know what I mean? Like, because my worship might look different if I wasn't so heavy, or my worship might uh, be different if my report, I heard a different report, or my worship might be different if I heard a command instead of like a suggestion, right? Like, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Like, you just wish, I wish I would have known that before I did that and made that decision. I wouldn't have made that decision that way, and, and I could have got, I wish I would have known my, the, 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 uh, the letter that I read that wasn't my girlfriend breaking up with me before I went to the amusement park and had a terrible day. That was somebody else's note written to Nate, right? A different, you know what I'm saying? Like, I wish I knew something different. Like, I wish I would have known. Okay? Um, and so we're going we're gonna to share the word here uh, before we do two things, or one thing before I do get to that, I just was reminded of. Uh, I had mentioned uh, that we're selling our house uh, dur- in, uh, in, during one of our messages. We're not moving anywhere, okay? Uh, we're not leaving the church. We're not leaving. Um, we are going to move, all right, but we're not moving from Arkansas. We're moving like a very short distance uh, into, you know, so I just wanted to clear that up. Someone said, are you leaving? Are you leaving? No, we're, we're pastoring here. God's called us here. We're going to be here. We're going to see the work of God finished until he tells us we're done, all right? So we're going to just close that deal, you know? Um, all right. All right. So I'll just make a, we're going we're gonna to be showing a video, uh, about 40 minute long video today, that, uh, following what I, what I share with you here. Um, if you'll put up that picture that I had given you, and, and, and I mentioned this about strings. Um, have you ever seen these puppets, you know, maybe you've seen like at an amusement park, maybe it doesn't look just like that, maybe it looks like a little furry creature and you can make them dance and whatever, and people are really good at, at you know what, it's called Manipulating. Manipulating. And um, I just had, had felt uh, very clearly, or heard very clearly, that um, cut the strings. Cut the strings. And so I'm just here to tell you, we're cutting the strings. You might say, I'm cutting the strings. I, I'm, not, I'm cutting the strings off of, uh, uh, for, off of pastor. I'm cutting the strings off of you. I, we're, we're not, we're not going to be manipulated by, by one another. I'm cutting the strings... I'm cutting the strings off of me from, from my wife. Like, the, listen, there's some men in here that, that your, your wives are maybe, maybe, you know, you're on a spiritual plane and, and you can't take the lead because you feel like uh, I, if I do that, then they're, like, there's just, I'm telling you, cut the strings. Be, be empowered to lead and to live from a place of truth and from your heart. We're going to cut the strings this morning. And I, and I just, I believe it's important that you hear this, that permission has been granted to you to cut the strings, that what you and I would do and you, how you and I would live and how you and I would worship would be one that is for an audience of one. I'm going to give you, we're going to go through a couple little, a couple scriptures, a couple little examples this morning, because it's not just enough for me to say, uh, cut the strings, but there's got to be some direction and understanding that so many times the strings, the, I don't want the strings on me. I'm like Pinocchio. Or, or Geppetto, you know, like, I don't want strings on my boy. I don't want strings on me. I want to be uh, one that has no strings. And yet, and yet the strings are placed upon us, right? It's not just that we, we have them. It's not like, oh, yeah, hook me up, hook me up. I just want to be controlled. Anybody here want to be controlled? No. But how often it, it happens because of, because of people's perception of us it, it is either like this. You are either no good or you're good, and everybody wants to be good. Everyone wants to be accepted. So if I do this, then I'm accepted. Or if, if, I, if, if I get the applause, how many of you know when you're a little kid, when you don't get the applause, you don't do that again? You, do, you, do, you try to find things that, 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 that you do good at. In other words, that other people would celebrate you for. And sometimes we find our identity in that. And this is where pastors can get, that, they're, that they're, uh, they're, they're sharing the word for an applause. But I'm telling you what's happening in this time and in this season that we're in, that no longer, I'm, you're going to see this, you're going to see this, that pastors no longer are going to be playing the, the, the flute. They're no longer going to be underneath uh, uh, like a 
Now, there will be some that remain that way, but there's going to be a separation, a staunchness that shares the Word of God very candidly, very freely, very accurately, just saying, this is what God's Word says, and they won't be pulling a string to pull a guilt trip on you, but they will say, you make the choice because you're going to stand before God one day, and it's your choice. And me say, telling you, you're going to stand before God, and he's, what he's asked you, what he's directed you, that's between him and you. But you've got a choice to make. And, and I'm not sharing God's word to manipulate your choice. I'm showing it to reveal you to you that you have a choice. And I wanted you to see this in Zechariah chapter 10. They said, ask the Lord for rain in springtime. Ask the Lord. Are we not in this season of like, Lord, send the rain? Or are we not in this season of where, I mean, you see it, where people are hungry, God, he said he would pour out, okay? Where people are hungry, he said he would fill you. But do the question is, too, do you, are you, do you really want to ask God to fill you? Do you really want to ask God for what you're saying? Have you thought this through? Like, have we thought through if I, what, it, what it means to... Take up a cross and follow him. Have, have we thought through that? Like, that might cost me. That might cost me, and I might have to say that I've been bought with a price. I'm not, this body, this life is not my own, it's his. I might, it might cost me something. Have I thought through? Have I thought through what, what, what it might look like if I say, uh, Lord, send, send the rain? And he does. Have I thought through what it might look like if there was prayer every morning that I might have to get up or because the Lord's asking me to be there and might have to give up maybe my workout? So I'll be there on two days a week, but not on these other days. Even though the Lord said, hey, I want you to be there. Yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there here and here and here. That's great. You can, we can deceive ourselves. I'm just saying, do we, we, what we're asking for, do we know what it could maybe cost? You know what it would, I'll just tell you this. Number one, it pays more than it costs. Because we have a good father. And um, he's always about our, our preservation um, and, and ultimately bringing us into the purpose and fulfillment for which we've been called. I want to read uh, Zechariah chapter 10 real quick. Ask the Lord for rain in springtime. The mo- Lord makes the storm clouds. Isn't that cool? You can even look at the sky right now. Not just the sky, but like, just not, like it gets spiritually that you can say that there's, it looks like it's going to rain. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You look off to the west and you see that little rain's coming. You better pull the vehicle in. You better close those windows. You better make sure that's covered up, right? There's some things you got to do because it might, you know, maybe some adjustments you got to make. Ah, oh, man, I was in the middle of a project. I was in the middle of a project, but the rain stopped my project. You ever been there? Maybe if you've been in construction, you had the tools out, you're running the table saw and all this stuff, and the rain's coming, you're going to have to pick up. You're going to have to pause because something else is happening right now. All right. So, um, and, he will give every, and he will give everyone showers of rain and crops in the field. It says, for idols speak a deceit and diviners see illusions. They tell false dreams and offer, offer empty comfort, comfort. Therefore, the people wander like sheep, oppressed, for lack of a shepherd. My anger burns against the shepherds, and I will punish the leaders. For the Lord of hosts attends to his flock, the house of Jericho, and he will make them like a royal steed in battle. He's talking about having shepherds that are attending the sheep, not just being shepherds that are irresponsible. And this is, so this is a message to me, but I'm just letting you know some of the things that are to me, because some of the things that are to me are also to you. Or they will affect you, okay? For the Lord of hosts attends to his flock in the house of Judah, and he will make him, them like royal steeds in battle. The cornerstone from which, uh, will come from Judah, the tent peg from him, as well as uh, the, battle, uh, the battle bow and every, rule, and every ruler together. He, they will be like mighty men in battle, trampling the enemy in the mire of the streets. They will fight because the Lord is with them, and they will put uh, the horsemen to shame. I just wanted to just re- see you have you see the reality what happens when somebody shepherds. When when the Lord takes up and he says it's time for the shepherds to shepherd it's time for me to and he says you the sheep will be like mighty mighty in battle. 
And he says, I, I love this, he says they will be like mighty men in battle. You know, anybody in some battles? Wouldn't it be nice that you just are a mighty man in that battle? Yeah. Trampling the enemy into the mire of the streets. They will fight because the Lord is with them and they will be like horsemen. And so I just wanted to just, just bring, bring that up. Um, it felt like that was important. You're going to see it the last uh, the verse that we talk on here. You'll see this. 2 Samuel 6, 14 through 23. And I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm trying to cruise through this because we're gonna, we are showing that video and we are worshiping. Um, you know, uh, today, if you give two hours of your week, um, two, two and a half hours, you will give almost 1% of your week. Just, just, just a skosh over 1%. If you're two and a half hours, you could give 1% today to the Lord. Is that too much? Okay, I don't think so either. So here's what it says. 2 Samuel 6, 14 through 23. And David, wearing a linen ephod, danced with all his might before the Lord, while he and the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and, and the sounding of the ram's horn. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Saul's daughter Michael, look, that's the one that he won from killing Goliath, looked down from a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. She despised him in her heart. What was he doing? He was wearing a linen ephod, which the best way, you know, looks just like, kind of like a gunny sack, a linen gunny sack, um, where you would have something maybe like tied around your waist, over the shoulders. It was what the priests wore uh, to serve the Lord, which the service of the priest was off to offer sacrifice. So there's a covering to cover. It was covering the, our, his outer garments, or he had removed his priest or kingly garments to put on this priestly garment, which is one of serving the people. Not the high priest garment, but a priest garment. So he looks like a commoner, and here he is dancing among the, everyone else. And it says, Michael... Michael despised him in her heart. That same, that same phrase is found over in 1 Chronicles 15, 29. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord was entering the city of David. Saul's daughter Michael looked down from the window and saw King David dancing and celebrating, and she despised him in her heart. Cut the strings. Cut the strings. David was not dancing for Michael. David was dancing for the presence of the Lord. But rest assured, but rest assured, there will be people looking down. I'm here to tell you, if you're going to do what you're supposed to, and live this life, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, you do it for the glory of God. There will be people in a window from a balcony looking down and thinking little of you. Here's what you'll hear. Hey, Joe, there will be people that look down on you for taking a stand of what are you talking about? Man, he's off of it. No, 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 no. So do you stand? Or do you cave? As the ark of the Lord was entered the city, again, David, uh, David, or Saul's daughter, Michael, looked down from the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in, the heart, in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord, and they set it in its place, in its place, in its place, in the temple. The presence of God is to be in its place. In this place, there, there remained, a, like Hebrews tells us this, there remains a Sabbath for the people of God. He, or, like there still is a, sa- a sacred, set-apart time for God's people to come together. You're saying, well, no, 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 don't you remember Acts 2.42? Yeah. Did you read Acts 2.46? Because you're talking out of the other end. So many people talk about the Scripture, and they, don't even re- they, don't, they haven't read the Scripture. But Acts 2.42 talks about how they met and they ate in their houses. Yeah, and Acts 2.46 says, and they continued to meet in the temple, but they ate and broke bread in their houses. So it's all of it. It's fellowship, but yet there's a corporate anointing of coming together. This is, what the, this is the law of first mention. When you see in Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit of God is poured out and the church is formed, Let's follow that pattern. We talked about this last week. The fellowship. There is a fellowship, a coming together. There's also a small group breaking bread, eating together. 
But there is something about coming together to worship the Lord. And that the presence of God, he inhabits the praises of his people. Let's keep going here. And it said that it was set in its place, inside the tent that David had pitched for it. But then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. When David had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And then he distributed to every man and woman among them a multitude of Israel, a loaf of bread, a date uh, cake, and a raisin cake. And all the people departed, each one, to his own home. As soon as David returned home to bless his household, can you just imagine this? Oh, God's here. Okay. <laughs> Saul's daughter, Michael, came out to meet him. How the king of Israel has dis- distinguished himself today. She said, he has uncovered himself today in the sight of the maidservants of his subjects like a vulgar person would do. But David said to Michael, I was dancing before the Lord who chose me. He chose me. He chose me over your father and all the house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. I will, I will, I will, I will will under circle line that I will celebrate before the Lord and I will humiliate and humble myself even more than this yet I will be honored people will whisper yet I will be honored by the maidservants of whom you spoke of whom you have spoken and Michael look at this and Michael the daughter of Saul had no children to the day of her death Two things, how you dance and how you talk. How you dance and how you talk. Both I'm calling into check here. Cut the strings. Do not put strings upon your neighbor. Do not put strings upon David. Do not stand in a window and judge somebody's response to the Lord. And do not let the presence of God rest in a place and not let it move you because of the people. 1 Peter 4, we talked on this last week. 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and sober so that you can pray. Above all, love one another deeply. Prefer one another deeply. As prefer, which means love, prefer what God prefers. Love one another deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without complaining. As good stewards of the manifold grace or the many-sided grace of God, each of you should use whatever gift he has received to serve one another. If anyone speaks, he should do it as conveying the words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength of God. Again, so that all things, so that in all things, God would be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom the glory and the power forever and ever are. Amen. Why we're here today is not the glory of a man. Why we come together is not to hear a good word or to hear a great song. It's to give God, the place that he deserves, the honor that he deserves, to to fix our eyes on him. When when the word of God is shared, we fix our eyes on him. See, when when the word when the word is spoken, the author is also there. This is the the, when we read, this is the only book when when the when when the words are read, the author shows up. Every time. You, You want a book signing? Open it up. You know what he'll do? He'll say, to Nate, and he'll personally sign it concerning what's going on today and the word that you need to hear. 1 Corinthians 10, 23-31. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is edifying. No one should seek his own good, but the good of others. So here we are in this, again, we're talking about cutting the strings. We're talking also about not putting strings on, right? 
And so he's talking about everything, is, but make sure that you're aware. Verse 2, no one should seek his own good, but also the good of others. In other words, you're, you're just that, that awareness, the good of others. It goes on to say, and I'm just going to jump down. Well, I'm going to finish reading this. Eat, uh, eat any, he said, eat anything sold in the market without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And he's talking about how some would say, well, you're not supposed to eat that. It's like this. Well, you shouldn't worship God on Sunday. You should worship him on Saturday. You shouldn't do this because of this. You shouldn't do that. And so there's like this, you're just not right. Are you healing on the Sabbath? I mean, he's talking to Pharisee talk. Like standing above. This is the standing above talk right here. Okay? And, and he says, um, if an unbeliever, but, but he says this, if an unbeliever invites, verse 27, invites you to do a meal and you want to go, eat anything set before you without raising questions of conscience. Go ahead and eat. But if someone tells you the food was offered to idols, then don't eat it because you would know in your own conscience that this isn't Okay? For the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. So he's like basically saying, uh, if, if you eat it and you say you're this, but you're going to say you're going to go ahead and make them happy and play the flute for them, he said you're going to hurt them. You think you're catering to them and, be, and making them accepted, but actually you're hurting them because you're not standing for what you said you stood for. He said, follow your, follow your conscience. Look at the, this next verse. Um, he says, for the, for the other's conscience, I mean not of your own, for why should my freedom, and this is what I'd ask you this, so why should, no strings, why should my freedom be based on what somebody else thinks? Cut the strings. Why should, why should you not be able to do what the Lord is you, in your heart wanting to do and desiring to do because of what somebody else thinks? Why should you not be able to share what you're supposed to share and the Lord put on your heart and to say it this way and, 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 and you've been called and I, Nate, a pastor by the will of God. Why could you not do what you know you're supposed to do because what somebody else thinks? Does it not say that? I'm referring to the other person, not yours. For why is my freedom that God has given me being judged by another's conscience, by what another one thinks? I, oh, thank you, Lord. So whatever you do, so if I partake in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced? Because for, for that which I've given thanks. Verse 31, so whatever I do, whether I eat or drink, he's really talking about your life, well, how you live your life. Let it be done for an audience of one. And I'm going to close with this, this Romans 14, and we're going to watch this video. Romans 14, 1 through 12. Accept him whose faith is weak. Without passing judgment on his, on his opinions, he's growing. For one person has faith to eat all things, while another... Uh, who is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not be little, the one who does not. Can you believe that they don't? Da, 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 da? Okay, Michael. Didn't you want to have kids? Wasn't that what you, isn't there a dream that you've been asking the Lord for? Isn't there something, a purpose that you were created for? Isn't there? All right. You want to hinder God's plan for your life? Go ahead and tie them up too. Tie them up, you tie you up. You want to get stuck? The one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. So he says the one who eats everything must not belittle the one who does not. The one who does not eat everything must not. Doesn't this sound like two little kids? Buddy, hey, I know he called you name. You can't call him names because he called you name. Now, buddy, no. You can't call him a name, and I, and I know that he, you know, but I know that he called you a name, and like, Lord Jesus, a bunch of children. What is that, just flesh? It's just conscious and, and very aware of self, isn't it? This is just how I was hurt, how I look, how I'm perceived, and this is what the enemy would love for you and me to get our eyes on us instead of on him. On our eyes on others. So who of you are to judge, verse 4, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. 
Who are you? And he, he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person regards a certain day above the others, while someone else considers it a day like uh, every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes a special day does so to the Lord. He who eats does so to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. He who abstains does so to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. Well, I, can't, well, why, I mean, why do you think they're fasting? They just think they're spiritual or something. <laughs> Can you believe that they're eating? It's January. Don't you know we need a 31-day fast? What the heck? In the church? Yeah. So that kind of stuff, that, that, that hinders this. I'm uncomfortable when I'm not doing what I was created to do. But I can remain. I can remain where I'm, where I'm was created to be. He goes on to say, "Who are you to judge some of servants for his own?" Oh, go, oh, verse six, or let's go back to verse five. One regards a certain day above others, while other people um, they consider every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes a special day does so to the Lord. He who drinks does so for the Lord. He or Eats does so for the Lord, for he who gives thanks to God, and he who abstains does so for the Lord and gives thanks. Verse seven, and none of us lives to himself alone. None of us dies to himself alone. We live, if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this reason, Christ died to return life. That he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. Verse 10. This is the highlighted, green, underlined, bolded portion in my notes here. Why then, do you not, why then do you judge your brother? Or why do you belittle your brother? Why does he lessen your eyes? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will confess to God. So then, each of us, right here, so then each of us will give an account for ourselves to God. Each of us to the Lord for ourselves. And so in corporate worship, there is to be, as we saw, this awareness of others serving, edifying one another. But in our worship, there's also to be an awareness of just one. We were talking this morning about cutting the strings, being aware of the time that we're in, being aware that, 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 that God, I mean, I'm just telling you, what, with the puppets, you'll find are, are, they, they won't be able to perform anymore. The puppets won't be able to perform. So if you've been putting on a show, rest assured, it's going to be like you're going to not find life anymore in putting on a show. And the show, the show, the, if you're going to be putting on a show, you'll leave the show. You're going to leave the show. The strings won't, won't be there. It's going to just be authentic and real. Amen? Let's just stand. Uh, um, I, oh, no, let's not stand. Stay sitting there. <laughs> thought I was done. We got this video, it's actually played in 1.25 mode. He's a little bit slower talker than I am. So really we could have probably went it in 1.5 mode. But just to get this, this, this in this morning and share all. You know, sometimes it's like I, you know that what needs to happen in this time, it, we don't just need to be about our own business. We need to be about our Father's business. And it might take us an extra 15 minutes to, to do that. But guess what it does? It prepares me and I'm prepared and I'm ready for those that I'm sent to. You know, you know what I'm saying? So go ahead and hit play on this video. This is uh, Rick Renner. Um, he's, this is actually at, uh, where we used to go to church. We're under our uh, Pastor Mac Hammond. And uh, hit play on that. And I'm going to walk up the Can stage and I'm going to walk up see your Bibles. before. Hold your Bible up in the air. You always bring your Bible when you come to church. Thank you. And I want you to open your Bible tonight to Matthew chapter 24. And tonight I'm going to talk to you about end time realities. And I'm going to give you a good reason for why you need to show up for the prayer meeting tomorrow at 3 o'clock. And Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for this time in the Word of God. And Holy Spirit, we look to you as the great master teacher. You are the one who wrote this book. 
You're really the only one that has the authority to teach it. And so tonight we defer to you, and we ask you, Spirit of God, to take us into the Scriptures until we feel them, we live them, and we're changed by them. Open our hearts, open our minds that each of us, including me, might be taught by the Word of God tonight. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Open your Bible to Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading from the King James Version. And tonight we're going to begin in verse 3. And verse 3 says, As he, that is Jesus, sat up on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be? If you have an ink pen or a pencil, circle the word when. Tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Either underline or circle the word what. Then if you would, either underline or circle the word sign. And then also underline or circle the word end and the word world. So when you come to verse 3, you find these key words, the word when, the word what, the word sign, the word end, and the word world. And when you really unpack this verse, you understand exactly what the disciples were privately asking Jesus. And first they said, tell us when. In Greek, the word when is the Greek word pote. It's very specific. It was the equivalent of saying, Lord, we don't want a general answer from you. We want to know specifically exactly when these things will come to pass. And what, the word what in Greek is the little word T. If you're taking a note, it's spelled T-I. It describes the most minute, minuscule detail. So the disciples were saying, Lord, we want you to really zero in. First of all, we want to know precisely, precisely when these things will be. Exactly what will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. The word sign is the Greek word suntileus. And actually, this word describes the sign that you would see as you're traveling along the road. It is the very same word we would use today to describe a road sign. For example, Denise and I live outside the city of Moscow. Isn't that amazing? And every day as we journey into the city of Moscow, we pass signs along the way. And the signs tell us where we are in the journey. The signs tell us how much further we have to go before we reach our destination. And if there were no signs, we would not know where we were in our journey. But the signs identify where we are, and the signs identify how much further we have to go. And the disciples here were literally saying, Lord, what will be the prophetic signs we'll see on the prophetic road to the end of the world. The word end here does not describe the end of the world as if the world is going to end because the world will never be end. The world is going to be changed. The word really is what will be the sign of thy coming and of the end or the conclusion of the world. The word world is the Greek word ionos, which describes an age. So they were literally saying, Lord, please, while no one else is here, it's just us and you and no one else is listening. We want to ask you some questions that we can't ask you in front of others. First, when exactly will these things be? And Lord, please tell us exactly when. And what, precisely what, will be the sign that we will see on the prophetic road to the end of the age to let us know where we are and how much time is left for the journey? And then Jesus begins to answer them. But what is interesting is they asked singular for one sign, but Jesus gave them many signs. And beginning in verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. But most people skip over verse 4 and verse 5 and just skip right to verse 6 where Jesus said, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. And it's interesting that if you go to Luke chapter 21, verse 11, Jesus adds two more things. Jesus said there will be fearful sights and great signs from the heavens. And these are two particular phrases which have really puzzled translators for years because the phrase fearful sights is the old Greek word for monsters. And that is a literal translation. At the end of the age, there will be monsters. In fact, you cannot translate that word any other way. However, today, that word makes sense to us because we are living in a world of monsters today. People that are transforming their bodies to be what their bodies are not supposed to be. And Jesus literally pro pro prophesied that we'd see monstrous things happening with people at the end of the age. And then he said, great signs from the heavens. The word from is the Greek word apo. It describes something descending right out of the heavens, implying that there will be some kind of heavenly activity in the skies when we come to the end of the age and that there will be an increase of that activity. Jesus didn't tell, it what, tell us what it was, but it shouldn't surprise us if we're beginning to see things in the heavens above. But while most people jump right to verse 6 
and talking about wars and rumors of wars, and then verse 7, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and famine and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Most people skip the first sign, which Jesus gave, which he also listed as the most predominant sign that we have come to the end of the age. And that first sign is in verse 4. And in verse 4, Jesus says, take heed that no man deceive you. The words take heed in Greek is the word blepete. It's a direct form of the word blepo, which means listen, listen to me. It's almost like he's reaching out to grab hold of their jackets and shake them up. He's really trying to get their attention. If you want to know what is the predominant sign, Jesus said, this is it. Take heed that no man deceive you. And Jesus listed worldwide deception as the primary sign that we have sailed into the last days, into the end of the age. And the word deception that was used in verse 4 is a very specific Greek word which the Holy Spirit uses repeatedly in the New Testament, the Greek word planeo. And what is very interesting about this word is this was a word which was popularized by writers between the intertestamental period, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Some people say that God didn't say anything in those years, but my friends, God has always been speaking for anybody who has an ear to hear. And in those intertestamental years, there was a fascination with the end of the age and the writers and the rabbis of that period, which radically affected the thinking of the New Testament and even the thinking of Jesus, prophesied that at the end of the age, spirits of delusion would be released into society. And that leads us to this word planeo. This word planeo, which here is translated as the word deception, means to lead someone off track. But not just that. It means to lead someone morally off track. And particularly, this word planeo describes a person who has walked upon a well-worn path year after year after year after year, but now for some reason he has decided to err or to divert from that path, and now he is walking treacherously along the edge of a very dangerous path. He has erred from what is sound and what is safe to a route that is morally dangerous. And in fact, this word planeo was the very word used by farmers to describe an animal that had gotten so lost it could not find its way back home. And now Jesus employs the use of this word deception, the Greek word planeo, to say at the end of the age, society as a whole will begin to divert from the moral path it always considered to be correct and will begin to walk on the edge of a very treacherous moral path that is filled with all kinds of danger. And in fact, it will appear that society as a whole has gotten so far off track that you will wonder if it will ever be able to find its way back home. And what is very interesting is this word planeo is used in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11, where it is translated as the word delusion. We could call these delusionary times. And my friend, if there was anything to describe the day that we're living in today, we are living in delusionary times. When people believe what is contrary to science, people no longer believe what they have been taught, but they have opted to divert from a well-worn path to embrace something which to us seems simply silly. But Jesus prophesied, this would occur at the very, very closing of the age. And what's really interesting in the New Testament is every time that you read about the coming of the Lord, it also always has a parallel text with deception, which finds these two things are going to run side by side. There's going to be deception right at the end before the coming of the Lord. Now, I want you to turn in your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And when you come to 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, begins to also describe what's going to happen in society at the very end of the age. And when you come to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, the King James Version says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. The word know is the Greek word ginosko. A better translation would be you emphatically must know this. You must understand this. And again, it is like the Holy Spirit is speaking so strongly, he's reaching out to grab hold of us. He says emphatically, categorically, you must know this. That, the word that in Greek is the word hoti. It's pointing to something very, very specific. It is the equivalent of the Holy Spirit saying, now I'm going to tell you explicitly exactly what you need to know. That in the last days, perilous times shall come. Well, some people say, how do we know we're really living in the last days? People have been saying for 2,000 years that we're living in the last days. Well, anyone who says we've been living in the last days for 2,000 years is theologically correct because the last days started on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out and Peter prophesied and quoted Joel chapter 2 and said, in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And the church age is also called the last days. But when you come to this verse, 
The Holy Spirit is not just speaking generally of that 2,000 years of church history, but he's pointing to the very, very, very end of the age. We know that because of the word last that is used here, which is the Greek word eschatos. It is where we get the term for eschatology, which is the study of the very last things. But this word last, the Greek word eschatos, was used very specifically to describe the very, very, very end of a thing. For example, you could use this word last, the Greek word eschatos, only to describe the last day of the week. Only the last day. You could use the word eschatos to describe the last week of a month, but only the last week. Or you could use the word eschatos to describe the last month of the year, but only the last month of the year. It points to the ultimate end of a thing. And in fact, this word was used to describe the ultimate ends of the earth, and the word last, the Greek word eschatos, was used navigationally to describe a ship that had sailed to the final port, and once they had reached this port, there was no more time left for the journey. That's the word that is used here. So now we understand that in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, the verse could already be translated like this. This know emphatically, categorically that when time has sailed to the last port and no more time remains for the journey, you will know it because perilous times shall come. What does the word perilous mean? The word perilous is the Greek word kalopos. If you're taking notes, you spell C-H-A-L-E-P-O-S. That word kalopos is only used two times in the New Testament. It's used here, and it's also used in Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. And in both places, it describes something that is so dangerous, we would say it's filled with high risk. If you get near to it, it is likely that you will be hurt. Therefore, you need to protect yourself because you're sailing into territory that is extremely perilous or dangerous. And I want you to hold your finger here and turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 28 to see the only other place where this word perilous is used in the New Testament. And this will help you understand what are perilous times. And when you come to Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, the Bible tells us Jesus crossed over the sea to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come to the other side, unto the country of the Gadarenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs. And if you're reading the King James Version, the next two words say exceeding fierce. Everybody say exceeding fierce. That's this word kalopos. And as it is used here, it describes these men as being so perilous, so treacherous, that they posed a risk to anyone who was trying to pass through that region. And that is why the verse goes on to say, so that no man might pass by that way. Well, if you've been to Israel, you know that there was an ancient road, a highway that went all the way around the Sea of Galilee. And on the east side of the Sea of Galilee was the country of the Gazarenes or Gadarenes, where these two demon-possessed men were. And there was a road that went from the north of the sea to the south of the sea. You could take it all the way to the city of Jerusalem. And if you were on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, that is the road that you would take. And now we find from Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, these men posed such a risk to those who were traveling on that road that people traveling on that road would stop. It was like they hit an impasse because when they reached this particular point, it was like peril came charging out of the tombs. This was a menace to the people in that region. And therefore, these men represented an impasse and people did not know how to get around them. Now keep that in your mind and go back over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. This know also, again, the Greek word genoskete, emphatically, categorically, you must know this, specifically that. When time has sailed to its last port and no time remains for the journey, you will know it because perilous times that feel like an impasse shall come. Shall come, in Greek is even important, the Greek word in is to me, the word in means to be in, the word is to me means to stand. When you compound the two words together, it describes a person or a group of people who are standing in the midst of something that surrounds them on every side. It doesn't matter where they look, they feel like they are surrounded by it. They see it here, they see it here in is to me. They're standing in the middle of something that is dangerous, it is treacherous, and it is perilous, filled with peril. And they feel they've hit an impasse because it feels so inescapable. They're standing in the midst of nonsense and deception. And now when you come to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, the Holy Spirit says, when you've sailed to the last port, you'll know it because you will feel morally you have had an impasse in society and everywhere you look, you will see nonsense all around you. And again, Jesus called this the age of delusion, the age of delusion. Now turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And when we come to Romans chapter 1, Beginning in verse 18, the Apostle Paul writes about what man will be like at the end of the age. He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold 
the truth in unrighteousness. The word hold in verse 18 is very important because it is the Greek word cat echo. The word cat echo really means to suppress. It's not that they don't know the truth. They know the truth. They don't like the truth. And therefore, they say, put a lid on that, cap that, suppress that, kill that story, bury that. It is the efforts of ungodly men to suppress the truth. And then it says in verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shown it unto them. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Then verse 21, because that, and in Greek, again, it has the word hote, because of this, specifically this, when they knew God, the word knew is the Greek word, Ginosko, which here describes a general knowledge of God, it's not describing a society that was all born again, but rather here it describes a society which has a fear of God. They have a knowledge of God. They have a respect of God. And Paul says there was a time when they generally knew God, they feared God, they respected God, and they glorified him not as God. Glorified not is a Greek word which means to stop glorifying God, almost as though it is no longer popular to worship God and acknowledge God as we once did, and therefore we're going to reverse this. We're not going to acknowledge. We're not going to glorify him as God any longer. And then it says, neither were thankful. And by the way, neither were thankful in Greek. The opposite of it describes a people who feel they are entitled. And when you are not thankful, you just feel you're entitled to everything. This is the age of entitlement. And the verse says, and became vain, the Greek word metaios, which means utterly wasted in their imaginations. The word imaginations, the Greek word logismos, which is where we get logical thinking. They became wasted in their logic, and their foolish heart was darkened. The word heart, the Greek word cardia, it's where you get the word for cardiac. It's the word for the physical heart. So you have to think about what the physical heart does. The physical heart pumps blood. It pumps and pumps and pumps and pumps and it pumps blood until every part of our body is affected by the pumping of the human heart. But now the Holy Spirit says at the end of the age, whereas the human heart pumps blood, the heart of society will be darkened. And just like the heart pumps blood, the heart of society without God will begin pumping and pumping and pumping and pumping darkness until darkness will begin to pervade society. And then when you come to verse 22, it says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. The word professing means alleging, alleging themselves to be wise. The word wise here, the Greek word sophos, alleging themselves to be progressive thinkers, alleging themselves to be the upper cut of society, the leaders of a new society. This is what they allege about themselves. But remember, these that are alleging that have ceased to glorify God. They have now moved into the age of entitlement. Their heart is pumping darkness. And all the while, they are professing themselves to be the new progressive thinkers of a new age. But Paul says, when in fact they became fools, and the word fools in Greek is the word moreno, and you can guess, it's where we get the word morons. And a literal translation is professing themselves to be progressive thinkers. In fact, in God's view, they became morons. That is a literal translation of that verse. Verse 23 tells us how moronic they became and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God unto an image made like to a corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Well, first, when you look at verse 23, it almost sounds like a lesson in zoology. What in the world is this verse about? Change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to a corruptible man, to birds, to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. What you have in verse 23 is a history of idolatry in reverse. This is one of the most brilliant verses in the entire New Testament that Paul, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, could summarize in one verse the history of idolatry. And if you study the history of idolatry, it began with creeping things. Everybody say creeping things. Man, in the earliest ages, worshipped bugs and snakes and creeping things. Then as time began to go by, man's mind began to ascend, and he no longer wanted to worship creeping things, so he began to worship four-footed beasts, cows, cats, all kinds of four-footed beasts. By the time that you get to the period of the Roman Empire, now man's mind has ascended again. They're no longer worshiping creeping things or four-footed beasts, but now they're worshiping the birds that fly. And that is why the eagle was the insignia of the Roman Empire. Their minds were ascending. They were thinking higher and higher and higher. And now in this verse, Paul literally says today, and at the end of the age, people will worship man. But before that, they worshiped birds. Before that, they worshiped four-footed beasts. Before that, it was creeping things. But at the end of the age, when man is full of himself, man will no longer worship these other things, but he'll focus on himself. 
and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. Man will become the center of his own worship. And then in verse 24, Paul adds, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Often people read verse 24 and they say, well, the problem is God. God just gave up on them. But in fact, that is not what the Greek says. The Greek says, wherefore God also released them. It is the equivalent of saying, if you no longer want me and you want something else, I will not hold you back. God released them to themselves. God released them to uncleanness. The word uncleanness used here always carries the connotation of sexual uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts. And notice this amazing statement, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And now we find from verse 24, at the very, very end of the age, we'll, always, we'll also know we've come to the end because we will be living in the age when people dishonor their bodies. They do things to their bodies that are dishonoring. But there's something else. This word dishonor also means to displace, to put bodies in configurations that are not natural. To put bodies where bodies do not belong. Then he says in verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Or man now is going to try to become his own creator. And when you become the center of your universe and believe that you are God, then you will believe you have the right to do what you want to do, to create what you want to create with no restraints. Verse 26, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, also having to do with sexual connotation. And again, when it says God gave them up, a better translation would be God released them. He released them unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. The recompense of their error is described in the following verse. The following verse says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. This is not a generation that does not know about God. This is a generation who once generally feared God, but chose they would no longer glorify God and neither express thanksgiving to him, but focus only on themselves and make themselves their own creators and put God away. Verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a what? Reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Reprobate mind is a recompense of their error, which was meet. The word reprobate, what does it mean? Well, when I was a boy, we called everybody we didn't like a reprobate. But we really didn't know what the word reprobate meant. The word reprobate, the Greek word adikimos, the word dikimos describes something that is marvelously made, it is fit, it is excellent in every way. But if you put an A on the front of it, that thing which was marvelously made has now become so modified that now it is a flawed mind. It's no longer a mind that functions as God created it to function, but now, because of the process of mental modification, false images, false truth, false teaching, pounding the mind, and land blasting the mind again and again and again and again, that mind which once thought so brilliantly and was made so miraculously becomes ill-affected because of what it is seen and what it is continually hearing. And here we have a description of what is happening in our world today, primarily through the media and through social media. As from every angle, the world is trying to lamb blast the minds of our young people to change the way that they are thinking. And we know from science today that the mind has a kind of plasticity. You can actually affect the way that the mind thinks and the way that the mind believes. You can change it. You can alter it. And if you lamb blast it enough, you can flaw the mind, and the mind will begin to believe what is wrong is right. And what is right is wrong, which is exactly what Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. He said, a day would come when men would call darkness light and light darkness. We're talking about the age of reprobate when the mind has been so modified that it no longer believes what it once believed. And what is really scary is that it's very possible for a Christian to become reprobate in certain areas of his or her life. If he hangs with the wrong crowd, listens to the wrong information, and allows his mind to be affected, though the Spirit of God lives inside him, he can modify his way of thinking that he no longer believes what he once believed, but now he's going with the crowd. He's embracing a more inclusive, woke kind of thinking. Mental modification. That's what the word reprobate really means. And when the mind has become reprobate, we find the fruit of it beginning in verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness 
fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignant whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, and listen to this, who knowing the judgment of God. This is not an ignorant people. This is a people who once knew the truth, but now planel. They have veered from the path they once walked upon to try something new. They have wandered off track. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now I want you to go in your Bible to 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to begin in verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, where the Holy Spirit again is speaking about the end of the age. And pointing 2,000 years into the future, the Apostle Paul writes, Now the Spirit speaks expressly. The word expressly in Greek is the word retus. It describes something that is emphatic, something that is categorical or unmistakable. The Spirit speaks emphatically, categorically, unmistakably. In other words, he's trying to make sure we really understand this is going to happen. And these scriptures were not given to scare us. They were given to prepare us. If we understand what is coming, then we can insulate our family and rescue the perishing and care for the dying that are all around us. The Holy Spirit's preparing us. Now, the Spirit speaks emphatically, categorically, unmistakably in the latter times. Here, the word latter, the Greek word husteros, describes the very, very end of a thing when not much is left over. Some, thank God, it says some, not all, but some shall do what? Depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. But notice it says some shall what? Depart. It does not say some shall abandon. It says some shall depart. There's a difference between abandoning and departing. To abandon the faith is outright rejection, but to depart from the faith is very different because here we find the Greek word ephistomy, the word apa, which carries the idea of space, and the word stami, which means to stand. A better translation would be in the end of the age, some will begin to put distance between themselves and what they once believed. They'll begin to put distance between themselves and the faith, and the faith, here's with a definite article, which means this is not faith for miracles or faith for finances, but this is the faith, the clear, sound teaching of Scripture, calling it into question as though it is no longer popular the way that it once was, and little by little, very slowly, methodically, the Holy Spirit in this verse describes a very slow departure, people who begin to distance themselves from what they once believed, maybe viewing it as something that's old or something that is archaic, something that doesn't fit into the presence. And why are they doing it? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And guess what? The word seducing, again, is that word planeo. The same word was Jesus used in Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, which means these will be spirits of seduction, particularly that cause people to morally err from what they once believed was right and was wrong. And notice it also says doctrines of devils. The word doctrines is the Greek word didaskali. It's a compound of the word didaskali, which means I teach. And the word kalos, which describes something really excellent. You put the two words together, we would describe this really well-packaged information. And here we find at the end of the age, the age which we're living in now, the devil's no longer going to come with a pitchfork in his hand and horns on his head, but he's going to come with well-packaged, convincing information, PR, bombarding the minds of society, bombarding the minds of children. This is why it is so dangerous today to send our young people to the university. Because in the university, they can lose their faith. They're being bombarded from their teachers. They're being bombarded by the courts, bombarded by entertainment. The devil trying to mentally modify an entire generation. And notice it says doctrines of demons, the Greek word daimonion. And in the first century, when Paul used that word demons, the Greek word daimonion, they believed that this daimonion spirits were the primary cause for delusion and lunacy and madness. Which means when these spirits have been released and people begin to follow them, it produces thinking that is off base. Delusionary thoughts, lunacy, error-filled confusion, because they have been seduced by these spirits with well-packaged information. Now go back over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I want us to look at verse 1 again. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. This know also, emphatically, categorically, know this, that in the last days, 
when time has sailed to the last port and no more time remains for the journey, periods of higher risk will come. You will feel you are surrounded on every side. And then as you continue in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he begins to describe in great detail all the characteristics of society at the very end of the age. Then when you come to verse 14, Paul says to Timothy, and he says to us, and here is God's instruction to us if we're living in the end of the age. But continue thou. Everybody say continue. Continue in the things thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So now when you come to verse 15, we Paul see that Paul was telling us regardless of the world does around us, we are to continue in the scriptures. And then in verse 16, he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. But notice at the first of verse 16, he says all scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God. Inspiration of God in Greek is the word theopneustos, and this is really important. It's one of those words that's difficult to translate because there's so much in it. Theo is the word God. The word pneustos, the second part of the word, has three meanings. First of all, the word pneustos is from the word pneu, and it describes a fragrance like a perfume. A fragrance like a perfume. Secondly, that word pneustos from the word pneu was the very word which was used to describe music music. When a flautist would put the flute to his lips and he would begin to breathe into the flute, it would begin to produce what was called pneu, such wonderful, beautiful music. And this word pneustos, which here is trans from the Greek word pneu, was also used to describe creative power. For example, you see it used like that in Genesis chapter 1, where it says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep and the Holy Spirit released his creative power. That's the same word, the word pneustos from the word pneu. And now Paul gives us this amazing revelation that the Scripture is so filled with the power and the presence of God that when you embrace the Scripture, when you take it into your life, it doesn't matter what kind of stink you have going on in your life. The Scripture will bring a new fragrance into your life. It will bring a new aroma into your home. Well, considering the society at the end of the age is going to be filled with a lot of stink, we need heavenly fragrance coming into our life. And number two, if you feel the music in your house is sad and things are dark, open the Word of God, dive into the Word of God, because the Word of God will bring a new sound into your life. It will bring new music into your house. And if things are really messed up and seem they are irretrievable, remember that the Spirit of God brings power in the Word. And the power of God, in the Word of God, has the power to recreate, create, set everything back in order. Well, this is good news. Especially if you consider we're living at the end of the age when people are going to be so affected. But we have something that has within it creative power. Creative power. The sound of heaven is in this book. The fragrance, the aroma of heaven is in this book. And the tragedy is believers have one in their bathroom, in the kitchen, in the bedroom, in the car, but they never open it. And in the book that they rarely open are all the answers that they need. In fact, there are so many answers in the Word of God that he goes on to say it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction. Everybody say correction. The word correction is a particular word which describes a person that has been knocked flat in life. Do any of you know anybody that's been knocked flat? Maybe knocked flat in their job, knocked flat in their relationships, knocked flat in their morals. But this particular word, correction, means to take a person that's been knocked flat and to pick them up and put them back on their feet again. Which means the Word of God has the ability to take that person that's been knocked down, pick them up, put them back on their feet again so they can function once again. And for instruction in righteousness, verse 17, that the man of God, in Greek it says, tis, anyone belonging to God, may be perfect, Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. What does that mean, perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works? It's a very unique word which is only used to describe one thing, so it only has one possible meaning. This was the word you used to describe a boat that was completely outfitted. There were two types of boats. There was the simple boat, which had no oars, it had no sail, it had no equipment, and because it didn't have any special equipment, it could go out a little ways, but it couldn't go very far. It certainly couldn't make it through rough weather. It would rarely make it to the other side. But you could take the identical same boat 
and thoroughly furnish it. You could give it an oar. You could give it an anchor. You could give it a sail. You could give it all kinds of equipment. And suddenly, that boat, which became so simple, is now so thoroughly furnished, it can make it through the roughest of waves. It can make it through the worst of weather. And it can sail all the way to the other side. Now, think how brilliant this is. Think how brilliant this is. The Bible is so amazing. Verse 1 of chapter 3 says this, Know also, when you have sailed to the last port, and no time remains for the journey. Then when you come to verse 17, he tells us it's okay because if the Word of God is working in your life, you'll have everything you need to sail through any weather. It will give you the anchor you need, the oars you need, the sail, everything you need to make it through the worst of times, the stormiest of weather, and you'll make it all the way to the other side. And that is why it is so important that you attend a church like this one. Say amen. Where the Word of God is proclaimed week after week after week after week. Friends, when Pastor Max stands in this pulpit and speaks, it's just like a good dose of health and common sense just pours out of him. I love to listen to Pastor Mac. The Word of God, which can equip you thoroughly, furnish you. Now, I don't think anybody in this room would question the age that we're living in or would question that we're living in delusionary times. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus enumerated a whole list of things we would see at the end of the age, but he listed this as number one. He said, when you see this, when you see deception working in society and people believing things that are contrary to science and are simply wrong, when men are calling darkness light and light darkness, you'll know you've come to the very end. But now we know from 2 Timothy chapter 3 that for us, there is an answer. You do not have to fall victim with the rest of the world. We are to continue. Everybody say continue. 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 Oh, that word continue is so powerful. I could teach a whole hour on it. I will not. It's the Greek word meno. The word meno means to abide, to continue. It also means to maintain the ground you've already gained, to not surrender your ground for any purpose. I wrote a book several years ago called How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy. That's the world that we're living in. But just because the rest of the world has lost their mind does not mean we have to lose ours. And in fact, today, if you'll just stick with the Bible and continue, you'll already be leagues ahead of the rest of the gang because you'll have common sense that will guide you. And when you're guided by the Word of God, it makes you smart. It makes you smart. You're able to discern what is right and what is wrong because the Word of God is working on the inside of you. And your children need this as well. And I want to say one more thing about children, and then I'll give this to Pastor Mac. A great concern today, I'm sure, by most pastors is the tendency of parents to cave for their children. They raise their children in church. They raise their children, teach them what to believe. And then, unfortunately, they see their children beginning to reject what they have been taught. So exactly what first... Peter chapter 4, verse 1 says, it's not an abandoning of the faith. They just begin to distance themselves. They have new friends. They want to be more inclusive. They want to be more open-minded, more woke in the way that they think. And parents tragically often say, if we don't bend and go with them, we're going to lose them. And rather than continue in what they believe, parents have bailed on their faith to accommodate their children. And here is the real tragedy. When those children really get in trouble and need help, they will not have their parents to come back to because their parents bailed. The most loving thing you can do is to abide by what you know to be true and not to bend, not to break. Amen. I want you to put your hand on your heart. I want to pray for you, my friends. This is why you need to all turn out for prayer tomorrow afternoon. We need to believe for God to move in this nation. God wants to pour out his spirit. People need a move of God in this generation. And Father, we thank you that the word of God is so abundantly clear. Lord, you did not give your word to scare us, but you did give your word to prepare us. And you love us so much that you have clearly communicated what those who live in the end of the age are going to see and experience. Help us to pay attention Help us to pay heed to your word. And Father, help us to be a tower of strength to our children and to those who are around us who need us. They need us. And we pray, Father, for a move of the Holy Spirit in this precious nation. Pour out your spirit, Lord. Move by your spirit across the United States. I pray this in Jesus' name.
And everybody said, amen. amen. Did you get anything out of this tonight? Amen. amen. Pastor Mac? Amen. It was good, wasn't it? Um, I think it's important for us to recognize the time in which we're in. This is the first thing. And you might, you might approach everything with this simple statement. What does the Word say? This is the first thing out of our mouth. What does the Word say? When you, when you hear just, just everything in our life, what does the Word say? And I wanted to speak for a moment um, uh, about insulating our, insulating our families, okay? Um, I have that first bubble wrap picture, if you'll put it up. <laughs> this is not what the Bible talks about, about insulating our children or our families. We're not to go find a hole somewhere. That's not. The next picture is what it looks like to to insulate. Look at the joy on his face. Because he's equipped. You know, we put we put shin pads on our little boys and girls that go out to play soccer, and we're okay for them to kick as hard as they can at a ball. And we're going, go, Johnny, go! But if they didn't have those shin pads and kids are, you know, coming in and they're just taking their swing at, all of a sudden, mom and dad are going to be like, oh my, oh my, oh my. Well, they're equipped. It's simple, isn't it? We don't wrestle against, it's spiritual. You might say that. It's spiritual. It's spiritual. What you're talking about, the delusion, it's spiritual. It, this is it's spiritual. There's so many things that we, we, that, that are very much spiritual, but we've just given them a, some kind of English name. And therefore, the enemy can work un, unhindered. It's spiritual. And the Word of God is spirit. It's spirit. And I wanted to just uh, to, to show you that and just reiterate. Take a stand. Keep that stand. Stand for what you stand for. Having done all to stand, stand there for. Doing what? Having, having gird yourself. It says in Ephesians chapter 6, Finally be strong in the Lord with the power of His might tells us to be strong in Him. And it tells us to put on the full armor of God. It goes on to the, in the latter part of that, verse 17, or maybe 16, talks about how the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Every one of those things has to do with the Word of God. But I wanted to close this morning before we stand to worship here with Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. Taking the helmet of the salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, verse 18. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer... And requests. With this in mind, and this is what I wanted to end on this last portion, because it has to do with what God's wanting to do. Be alert and always keep on praying for all of God's people. Interesting. So many, how many of our prayers, like how, how, many, how, how many times could you say when somebody's got some separation? You know, maybe they're, they, haven't, they haven't left the faith. But they've, they've, they've created a little bit of separation. They're still, man, they're, there they are walking away. Do your words matter? Why don't you just go ahead and let, that, let your words, there they are, walking away. Why don't you just let that really truly be the bit in the horse's mouth and, and, and in a sense the, the rudder for their ship as you declare over them, there they are walking away. Keep walking, buddy. Keep walking. Just go ahead. Just go ahead. Just keep walking off the edge. The Bible tells us that, they're to, that, 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 we're, that He's going to be known by our love for one another. We're to declare the truth. We're not to move off the truth. But we need to look at our love and how we're praying for people. What we're saying. Are we controlling and manipulating? You, you and your words, me and my words, we can walk people either right towards God or we can walk them right off the cliff. He says this at the end there. He said, he said keep praying. Keep praying, Father, thank you. Maybe you're aware of a son or a daughter or an aunt or an uncle that is so lost, like what they've lost their ever-loving mind. I cannot believe, and maybe that's part of a conversation, or, or maybe you're, you're just aware of that. If you're aware, 
God is showing you to take a sword, to take a stand, to, to, to use your mouth, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and cut the strings. Cut them off of them. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus that they would know the hope to which they're called. Ephesians 1. But let's just jump to Ephesians 3. We always we quote Ephesians 1 a bunch. That the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened and they know the hope to the call. Okay, yeah. Lord, let, let them see. How many times do you and I see and we want something but we just can't or we just don't or we... Father, I thank you that they would know the exceeding greatness of your power which is in them and for them who believe. Ephesians 3, 16. That they would know the power and come to know and ask fully... My God, we need the power. Philippians 2, 13. Thanks, it is God who's given me both the will and the do. Giving me both the will and the desire to do according to his pleasure. Lest you think, yes, you and I think, let's I think. It's not by the grace of God that I stand here to share the word as being true. He found me. He's kept me. He's calling. The Word of God has the power to take somebody and, 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 and pick that's fallen down in the mud. He said it so perfectly. And pick them up and set them back on their feet and thoroughly equip them to take them all the way through. This is why we're here. This is why we're here, what? To share the Word. And that's one of the most important things that's been going off on the inside of us this, this year. almost got tears because I've never even seen this part of today um, but now I'm walking in it I sat on my front porch this fall one of the beautiful mornings sitting with Ev and we had the word out and we were listening to a message we were just having just an extended time just sitting there extra long and it's just like the Lord was speaking to us it's time to get the word out it's time to get the word out and uh, for so long I disqualified myself matter of fact that was confirmed about 3 o'clock in the morning yesterday evening talking with my former youth pastor as uh, we had the God talks till 3.30 in the morning but about 3 o'clock in the morning after this God talk he said you know if I could tell you one thing that I've seen on you and I've seen on your family you guys disqualify yourself he said what I just sit and heard and what you shared with me, he said, it's, it's wisdom. And I just shook my head like, ah, you know, nah, whatever. And he said, no, I'm serious. I need you to listen to me right now. And it was almost like a youth pastor again. Yet he would tell me that he's learning from me over and over and over and over and over again but here in this moment he said I want you to listen I, I'm, I'm, I'm serious I want you to listen I want you to I want you to stop disqualifying yourself because it, it'll, it's hindering the, all that's there and I kind of smiled you know and just he's exactly right what we're supposed to be doing so this is one of the things for us as Beyond Church to know him and to make him known you know how we're going to do that? We're going to preach the word. We're going to preach the word because it is holy. It's truth. It's the only thing that can set men free. It's the only thing that can restore marriages. It's the only thing that sets men, takes them out of the muck and the mire and puts them up. It's the word. It's the word in our mouths. It's the word in my mouth. It's the word in our mouths. It's the word going forth into the highways, into the byways, into the all of these. That, it's the word. And we not ashamed, but bolder and, and, and further in the word of God. 
And that's what I was sharing about earlier, just, just a moment, but I'm just telling you the word of God from this place. Because, not because of what's just in a man, but because of what is, is in a sense, an opening to, tr- to pull the pull. You know, you know there's a pull? There's a pull from, the, from, from a congregation, hungry hearts. There Jesus went to his hometown, there he could do no mighty work. What happened where there was hunger? Heaven was pulled. Your expectation and invitation for God to move. I'm telling you, it's time to, and this is in this place, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. We're not ashamed, and I'm telling you, that God's moving. And the word of God, it, 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 it's setting men free. And, 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 and freedom's in these words. And, 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 and corrections in these words. And life's in these words. And children coming back to Christ is in these words. And the lost being found is in these words. And the hurt, the, our, the wholeness, the healing, and freedom is in the word. In this house, let's stand. Can you lead us in worship, one? I know it's 11.50. I don't know what song you're going to sing. I believe that this morning was was... There was so much that was needing to be communicated and so much that was that we were very aware that these this time and the season that we're in matters. And maybe you don't know how to share Jesus. This is one of the things we were talking about. But do you know how to talk about the weather? You know, when it's raining outside, man, it sure has wet, been wet the last few days. You know what season we're in? We just, we just heard a whole message about the season that we're in. Man, we talk about springtime. We talk about these. Let me tell you, you know you can talk about the season that we're in. Oh man, things are getting crazy out there. Do you know Jesus? What an opportunity. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. that it brings light where there's darkness it brings and is a lamp unto our feet and it shines ahead we thank you that it is what equips us for everything you've called us to it's what corrects us it's what sustains us thank you that it's what sustains our children I just want right now before we go into this worship I want you to I want you to think about or listen in your spirit for who the Lord would bring to you, maybe that you've been talking about, maybe that you've been, your heart wants and longs so much for them to come to know and come back and and reconnect to Christ. And we're going to take a moment right now and we're going to pray for them. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up those that have have, uh, walked or, or, or stepped away. Father, we're asking right now, for, for light to find them. We're asking right now for their hearts today to be flooded with light and for uh, the, your power to, to be at work and, and, and to, to, to illuminate their hearts and to illuminate their eyes and that you are giving them both the grace, the grace, the gift. Give them the gift of will. Give them the gift, Father, today to come and to hunger for you. Father, thank you for restoring. You're not too lost. You're not too far gone. You're, you, you, you didn't make enough and too bad of decisions. You didn't, you, you, no, Father, I thank you for, for a, a father on a hill. I thank you for the father, you, the father on a hill. I thank you for these people, like, like as it were, Christ making y- you, you through us, Father. Fathers on a hill, mothers on a hill, longing and looking for a homecoming. Father, I thank you for a reinstating and a ring. Father, I thank you for, for just, just your church being, being the extension of your goodness. Father, this your people. And so for our brothers and for our sisters, for our aunts and our uncles, for our friends, to know you, Father, to know you, to meet with you, to meet with you. Thank you for God, for God encounters. We just loose angels about this. Uh, we, you told us to, to bind and to loose. And so, Father, we thank you for just uh, sent ones, ministering spirits to go and, and, and not only to guard them, but Father, but oh, Father, thank you for messengers. 
Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 As we worship today, we're going to worship the Lord. If you, um, uh, one of the things that's been in my heart just lately is uh, returning service to service. <laughs> we have church service, but service is about service. And so sometimes um, I, I got corrected pretty hard on this in my heart. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll say, hey, after service is over, if you need prayer, if you need healing in your body, or you need blah, you know something, it sounds almost like Charlie Brown, wah, 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 because we just dismiss early um, instead of letting it be a part of service. And uh, I think it's dishonoring is what I think. Got. So if you, if you are here today and you uh, want to give your heart to Jesus, and you, maybe you want to rededicate your life, or maybe you need healing in your body, um, I, I, myself, Pastor Evan, uh, Landon, boy, and I'm gonna, we're going to work on building teams of people that want to have a heart to pray for people and say, you know what, we want to stand in agreement. It's, it's just time that the church be the church and not just the, pa the pastor be the, you know. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you, I'm making myself accountable by communicating, you know, because sometimes it's easier just to just, maybe if it didn't come out all right and perfect and whatever, and you went a little long and blah, 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 just to get off the stage and wipe the sweat because of the nervousness and like, oh, I didn't do good and blah, 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 and just get off instead of saying, Lord, this is services about you. This service is about serving your people. How can we serve them today? Amen. Amen. You can lead us in worship. And, and if you need healing or you need agreement of prayer, we'd love to, love to have you come down. Thank you.